Hello, I'm Renee Brown, pastor of the Mount Zion First Baptist Church. Welcome to our live stream broadcast. Whether you're viewing by Facebook Live or YouTube, we are honored to have you here and we hope that this experience will be a powerful encounter. God bless you and I hope to see you in person real soon. And we want to welcome you and thank you for tuning in and worshiping with us at the Mount Zion First Baptist Church. And we're going to ask that if you would be so kind uh, to bow your heads as we open with a word of prayer. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for yet another day, another privilege of being able to stand in this sacred place and to be able to give you what is due unto you. We thank you for the privilege of worship and we thank you for the opportunity of praise. And so, Father, as we gather together in this place, we ask that you would touch each and every home that is tuned in. We ask, God, that your spirit would fill every house that you would turn those houses into places of sanctuary, that your presence will be made known, that your word will be heard, and that the people of God will be edified as a result of hearing your word. And so, Father, we ask now that your Holy Spirit would lead and guide us in this worship experience. We thank you, give praise and honor to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Why don't you stand on your feet right where you are? Why don't you stand on your feet right where you are and give our God a hand of praise? Come on, lift him up higher as our praise and worship team lead us in this praise period. Come on, put your hands together and tell God, thank you. Good morning, Mount Zion. As we enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his court with praise, we want to be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. And we are so happy on this morning. Come on and sing with us. Woo!
sing hallelujah. Thank God this morning. Hallelujah is the highest praise. Yes. So this next song says, I've decided to make Jesus my choice. Yes. I don't know about you, but this speaks volumes at this time. Listen. Some folks would rather Listen, this is what happens. The road is rough and the going gets tough. The hills are hard to climb. I've sorted it out a long time. It's rough and the growing gets tough. The hills are hard to climb. I saw it out a long time ago. There's no To 
and said why does this generation ask for a miraculous sign I tell you the truth no sign will be given to it then he left them got back into the boat and crossed to the other side I want to talk about it ain't happening it ain't happening. It was troubling for me to settle on this title with the word ain't in it because in grammar school they told us never say ain't. Uh, but since then they have added ain't to the dictionary. And so I thought it would be fitting to say it ain't happening. Brothers and sisters, a few weeks ago when we started this series that we entitled 2020 Vision, we had no idea that this pandemic would take place. And so we made a detour to address the pandemic and now we're back to where we were to look at 2020 Vision. In the first sermon, we entitled it Sent Away because the disciples in the first 11 verses of Mark chapter eight wanted to send the followers away from the presence of Jesus hungry. And Jesus said to them, let's feed them. And so today we pick up where we left off and in that first sermon we talked about sacrifice, we talked about scarcity and then we talked about service. And one of the most important things about being a believer is your willingness to serve. And so again, I want to remind you that in the book of Mark, it is written during a time of acute persecution. People were being killed for being Christians. It discusses, it discusses Jesus' identity, the role of suffering and the necessity of faith. I want you to get this, the role of suffering and the necessity of faith. And so oftentimes suffering comes in an effort to help us to strengthen our faith. And so brothers and sisters, when you look at the entire eighth chapter, there is a sight problem in every section of chapter eight. There is a sight problem in every section of chapter eight. Mark is writing to a Gentile audience. People who are not steeped in Jewish tradition, people who are not familiar with the Bible, people that are not familiar with all of the ins and outs and the nuances of this new relationship that they have with Jesus Christ. He is writing to those who lived outside of the area in which Jesus ministered. Those who had not witnessed the events of Jesus' life. Mark focuses on the actions of Jesus more so than he does the words of Jesus. So Mark says to this outcast crowd, this crowd who's on the fringes, this crowd that's on the outside, this crowd that's the lost, the left out, and the least. Mark is talking to people who have not seen the works of Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, there are three external factors that are at work during the time of Mark's writing. And this is important. There are three factors, three things that's taken place. Number one, there was the Jewish religion that was putting constraints on the people. The Jewish religion, putting constraints on the people. Would you say constraints? But then, secondly, it was the Roman politics. The Roman politics 
politics. Can you say politics? And then the third thing, it was the Hellenistic culture. Hellenistic culture. Can you say culture? So when you look at all three of these things, brothers and sisters, constraints, politics, and culture. When you look at what was happening in that day and time, it marvels to the same thing that's happening today. People are having constraints put on them simply because of the virus, and then the politicians are arguing about when we should go back to normal and when we should not. And at the same time, the culture that we are used to has been slowly taken away from us, and now we're grappling with what do we do? Same thing is happening in the text. And that brings us to our focal point. There are two types of blindness. Number one, there's physical blindness. And number two, there's spiritual blindness. Spiritually blind people generally don't know they're blind. It's often said that when a person loses one of their senses, then one of the other four senses is heightened. And I remember when I was watching the movie Ray for the first time, I remember distinctly how he was losing his physical sight. And as he was losing his physical sight, he began to develop the feel. He developed a better touch. And as a result of the loss of his physical sight, he learned how to sew numbers in his socks so that he could determine if his socks were black or blue. And brothers and sisters, I have physical sight and I still have trouble determining if my socks are black or blue. And so he put these numbers in the socks to help him to know what color his socks were. But not only that, he discovered that he could feel a person's hand and determine in his mind what they looked like. Now, I don't know how he did that, but based on the movie, evidently he was pretty good at determining how a person looked based on how he felt when he touched their hands. And so my brothers and sisters, what are you saying, Pastor? What do you do when your spiritual sight is weak? I would propose that you depend more on your physical sight because your spiritual sight is weak. Mark shows us faith, a principle which can open our eyes and our hearts to spiritual reality. And what I discover when looking at this particular chapter, Jesus always leaves you with something. So whenever you encounter a relationship with Jesus, it feels like you're losing something. But when you lose something, he also gives you something else to replace that which you lost. And so when you look at what Jesus does in this text, it's interesting to take note. And so I want to begin this sermonic presentation by explaining and helping us hopefully to see what we should do when, first of all, our rivals show up. When our rivals show up. Can you say rivals? All of us have rivals, whether you want to or not. All of us have people who we see as enemies. All of us have people who are against us at some point in our lives. And when you look at the verse 11, it says clearly that the Pharisees showed up. The Pharisees came and began to question. The Pharisees came and began to question. It's, it's interesting. The Pharisees came. The Pharisees, the, the separated ones. They were the religious and political party in Palestine in New Testament time. And these Pharisees were known for insisting that the law of God be observed as the scribes interpreted it for their special commitment to keeping the laws of tithing and ritual purity. Let me say it another way. The Pharisees were responsible for making sure that whatever was written down by the scribes was carried out by the people. And let me say it another way. The, the Pharisees made sure that when you came to church, whatever the Bible says you ought to do, they made sure you did it. Amen, somebody. But then there's this other group that the Bible doesn't talk about in this verse, 
But, but it's interesting, the, the Herodians, it's another group that Jesus had to deal with. They were the Jews who had the influence. They were the Jews who had standing in the community. They were the Jews who the Greeks looked favorable upon. They, they were the ones who were responsible for the Roman law in New Testament times. And, and it's interesting because although the Herodians cannot be compared to the Sadducees, which is the next group I'm going to talk about, brothers and sisters, they found themselves siding with the Sadducees. Don't miss that. They, they sided with the Sadducees. So now you got the Pharisees, but then you have the Sadducees. And brothers and sisters, the Pharisees were anti-Roman. But the Herodians, on the other hand, were supportive of the Romans. And as a result, they opposed the Pharisees because they didn't like Roman law. And so the Herodians joined forces with the Pharisees in opposition to Jesus. This is interesting. They, they, they didn't like each other, but they liked Jesus less than they did each other. And so as a result, they came together to get Jesus, even though they didn't like each other. Okay, let me slow down. Let me pause. Isn't it interesting that you have folk that don't like each other, but they like you less, and they'll come against you all because they don't like you. And so I looked at the text. It couldn't help but see. And we look at Mark chapter 3, verse 5 through 6. Mark chapter 3, verse 5 through 6. The Bible says he looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. Said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Now, they don't like Jesus. And they really don't like the fact that Jesus heals a man in the temple and so as a result of that they go out to plot to kill Jesus isn't it interesting that when you go about doing good there's always always somebody out to kill you because you did something that was good but then here's this third group that I want to mention because I think it's important the Sadducees they are also a member of the Jewish faction that opposed Jesus and during his ministry they made it, it they made it their business to create problems for Jesus they were known for their denial of the bodily resurrection of Jesus they were the ones who said somebody must have stolen the body it was the Sadducees who came from the leading family of the nations of the priests the merchants and the aristocrats the high priests and the most powerful members of the priesthood were mainly Sadducees so if you pay attention to what's happening, brothers and sisters, in America in particular, but if you pay attention to what's happening in the Bible, the haves are against the have-nots. And Jesus has come on the scene to help the have-nots to be equal to the haves. And what I've discovered whenever somebody has more than what you have and they see you gaining what they have, they all of a sudden have a problem with you. And, and so I'm, I'm looking at all that's going on and, and everybody is looking for stimulus checks. And it's interesting that it's being reported that the big companies are getting the majority of the money while the small companies have been denied the opportunity to get stimulus money. But, but don't just get caught up in that. It's always been that way. The people who have often get more and the people who don't have often get less. And you wonder why you still have poor people because those who have are more concerned about keeping what they have than making sure that those who don't have can at least get a piece of the pie. Amen, somebody. And so look, Jesus deals with his rivals, the Pharisees. But then why are they coming to him? What's the reason? That's the second thing. What's, what's the reason? I'm, I'm glad you asked. The Bible says that they came to him and began to question Jesus. Why? To test him. They wanted to test him. They wanted to test him. Now here's, here's where the rubber meets the road. They wanted to test him. Listen to this, brothers and sisters. What does it really mean to test? It's to give experience. It's to give a trial. 
It literally means to test by application. It, it means to test by solicitation. It, it suggests the idea of soliciting a person to get them to sin, to prove that someone has been evil. It, it's, it's to test you, to get you, to coerce you into sin. Don't, don't miss this. The Pharisees are trying to get Jesus to sin. It's interesting. You look at Matthew chapter 16, verse number one. It's, it's, it's interesting in Matthew 16, verse number one, and those verses that are following, but in particular verse one, it says, the Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, when evening comes, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning today, it will be stormy for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the time. And then he says they are a wicked and adulterous generation. They're trying to test him to see if he is who he says he is. And in this day and time, in the midst of everything that's going on, I want to suggest to us, brothers and sisters, don't let people test you into trying to prove who you are. They're trying to get Jesus to show them what he is working with. They're trying to get him to prove to them that he is who he says he is. And I've discovered a long time ago, stop trying to convince people that you saved. Stop trying to convince people that you're born again. Stop trying to convince people that you're Christian. You shouldn't wear a cross just to prove to somebody you saved. You shouldn't have to carry a Bible and quote scriptures to prove to somebody you saved. People ought to be able to look at you and see that you saved because when you have an anointing on you, people can see the anointing whether you believe it or not. So stop trying to prove to people who you are. And in this day and time, in the midst of everything going on, we are arguing about who really is saved and who really is not. Who really has faith and who really does not. Can I say this to you? I don't have to prove to you that I'm saved. I don't have to wear a mask to prove that I'm saved. I don't have to go into a crowd to prove that I'm saved. I don't have to go without washing my hands to prove that I'm saved. I don't have to do stuff to prove that I'm saved. Stop letting people convince you that you need to do something to prove that you're saved. You ought to at least have good sense. And so if they suggest that this is what you ought to do and what you ought to wear, then that's what you ought to do. And don't try to prove that you all trust spiritual. That you're so holy that sickness can't get you. Listen, I've lost some good friends to this virus. I've lost some people I've known over the years to this virus. I don't have to have anybody prove to me that the virus is real. I know it's real. And just because you wear a mask does not mean you don't have faith. Just because you won't go in a crowd does not mean you don't have faith. You just being sensible, shout back sensible. Because what God is looking for is some sensible people. And one of the factors that's playing out right now is the Christians have not been sensible over the years. And we've allowed two or three people to tell thousands of us what to do. And that's not sensible at all. We've allowed two or three people to take prayer out of school. That's not sensible at all. We've allowed two or three people to take down statues and Ten Commandments and so forth. And God is saying, you have not been acting sensible. Now I want you to start being sensible. And so, brothers and sisters, look who's coming at Jesus, the Pharisees. And they're saying, I know who you are. But Jesus also is saying to us, I know who you are. And I know why you're coming at me. So understand, whenever your rivals come at you, brothers and sisters, please hear me when I say this. They have a reason for coming at you. And most of the time, their reason for coming at you is to try to prove that you are not who you say that you are. Be careful when you try to prove to people what the people have already decided in their minds that you are. You, you better know who you are regardless of what people say. I had to learn early in life, just because people call you stuff, 
don't mean you have to answer. Just because they call you a certain name doesn't mean you have to answer. Just because they say that about you doesn't mean it's true. So when somebody says something to you and you don't like it and you know it's not the truth, can I ask you something? Why are you getting upset? If you know it's not true, why are you going to argue? Why are you going to debate them about what they say about you? Who cares what they say? I'm always intrigued when people say, well, pastor, you know, they say. And so I ask them, well, who is they? Because, see, they quick to say they. And the truth of the matter is it, they are a part of the they. But they're going to throw it off on somebody else. Why do you know that? Because, see, if they were as bold as the person telling you, they would have come and told you themselves. But instead, they send the other person and let them speak on their behalf. Because birds of a feather flock together. So then let's look at his response. Okay, you got the rivals. The reason that they come in, they want to test you. But then here's the response. Look at verse 12. And this is interesting to me. The Bible says he sighed. Before he spoke, his facial expression said he was not happy. It, it says in the verse, it says in the verse 12, notice he says, but I tell you, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong spot. I forgot to turn my Bible back. Mark chapter 8 verse 12. He sighed deeply and said, he, he sighed deeply. I, I said to you in the introduction, Mark focused more on the actions of Jesus than he did the words of Jesus. So the first thing that Mark notices in the midst of what's going on is a sigh. What then is a sigh? So when they said what they said in verse 11, when they asked him the question in verse 11, this is what Jesus which suggests he inhaled and then he exhaled because the word there suggests to breathe so when they said what they said Jesus took a breath let, let, me, let me go back they asked him for a sign and Jesus said Before he spoke, he gathered himself together. And I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, when the enemy comes to you and tries to get you to prove who you are, before you start shooting off at the mouth, take a deep breath. Think about what you're about to say. Ask the Holy Spirit to come in. It's, it's interesting that it says breath, pneuma, the same word that we have for Holy Spirit. Isn't it interesting that Jesus took a breath? He took in some Holy Spirit before he made his declaration. It's interesting because when you look at Luke chapter 11, verse 29, it says, as the crowds increased, Jesus said, this is a wicked generation. It asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be to this generation. Notice he said wicked and generation. But then Mark chapter 3 verse 5, it says he looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. He's anger and deeply distressed. But then Mark chapter 7 verse 34, he looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Epaphatha, which means he be opened. Again, he says in Mark chapter 9 verse 19, oh unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Every time Jesus saw a lack of faith, he took a breath every time he saw a lack of faith he took a breath he gathered himself together before he said something because he wanted to make sure whatever he said would have an impact on the person that was listening 
So the first thing that happens, brothers and sisters, he sighed. But then the next thing, he spoke. And he asked a question. Why does this generation, why does this generation, I, I think this is applicable to the 20, 20 year we live in. Why is this generation the way it is? That's what Jesus is saying to us today. Why are you looking at me like this? Can I say it like this? You looking at what you're looking for. Jesus said, you are looking at what you're looking for. You're looking for the answer. I'm the answer. You're looking for the vaccine. I'm the answer. You're looking for what needs to be done. He said, you're looking at what you need to see. Jesus says, listen, <laughs> you looking for me to be the Messiah, you already looking at the Messiah. But they didn't understand what they were looking at, just like we don't understand what we're looking at. And so I say this, brothers and sisters, there are two things about this generation that it says in the Bible. Number one, they're wicked. They're bad. And then secondly, it says they are adulterous. Wicked, bad. Matthew chapter 13, verse 38. He said, the devil is the evil one. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16 says that the devil is the evil one. 1 John chapter 2, verse 13 says that we have to overcome the evil one. Isn't it interesting that the evil one is capable of messing up every one? And so when you look at what's going on today, brothers and sisters, it's the evil one. It's the wicked that's causing the problem. And God is saying, you're looking at the solution, but you're going to have to deal with the evil one, the wicked one, because that's the one that's causing the real problem. And then he says that the generation is an adulterous generation. And, and I, I always shudder when I have to talk about adultery because, you know, in church it used to be a bad thing, but now church folk do it too. One who was, one who has had unlawful intercourse with a spouse of another. That's what you call adultery. One that's sleeping with somebody that they're not married to. That, that's what you call adultery. One who has transferred their affections from God. You see, in a spiritual sense, James chapter 4, it says, you adulterous people, don't you now, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God? That's in the spiritual sense. So whenever the world and the church are getting along, that means that the church has become adulterous like the world. Whenever Christians get along with worldly people, that means that the Christian has decided to sleep with the world. And God is saying that's not becoming of a child of God. But then in the physical, I mean in the natural sense, 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 14 says with eyes full of adultery watch this they never stop sinning they seduce the unstable they are experts in greed and a cursed brood look at what's happening in society right now Peter says when your eyes are full of adultery you know what you just keep on sinning you go from one sin to the next sin to the next sin. And what makes it so bad is that you then seduce people who don't have the necessary faith to operate the way they should. And so as a result, not only are you in sin, but then now you pull somebody else into sin. And look at what's happening all over this country. Brothers and sisters, you got the experts. The experts are now saying, let's open up everything. The same experts that said, shut down everything, now saying, let's open up everything. Let me tell you why, because when the money gets funny and the change gets strange, people change. Amen, somebody. Notice, most of the stuff 
we've been cheating on God with, we no longer can do. Notice the stuff that we've been playing around and fooling around on God, we can't do that stuff now. We under quarantine, we in lockdown. We can't do the stuff we usually do. Well, what do you mean, Pastor? What, what kind of stuff are you talking about? The stuff we usually do on the weekend, you know the stuff we do. No NBA, no NFL, no NHL, no MLB, Major League Baseball, no NCAA, no horse racing, no Pop Warner football, no family reunions, no funerals. You know, we do all funerals on Saturday. We can't even have good funerals now. No repass. And on Sunday, you can't even have a long worship service. Isn't that interesting? The stuff we used to make time for and didn't have time for church. Now, God said, you got plenty of time. Do what you want to do. But then that brings us to the signs. He says they're looking for signs. They're a wicked, adulterous generation. And whenever people look for signs, it's because they are wicked and adulterous. That's what Jesus is saying, not, not the pastor. That's what Jesus said. He said, so if you gotta have a sign, that means you have not spent enough time in Sunday school. If you got to look for a sign, that means you have not spent enough time in the word. See, you don't have to have a sign. You ought to know that God is showing you on a daily basis signs. Every day you wake up, you should have to have somebody tell you you need some signs. Let, let me see if I can't make it plain. I, I, I don't need somebody to tell me I'm getting older. Every time I have to read, I have to put these on. It tells me that's a sign that I'm getting older. It used to be I just could jump up out the bed and hit the floor running. Now I have to think about it. I don't have to have anybody tell me I'm getting older. Just when I think about getting up, I just can't get up like I used to get up. I, I don't need any signs. I, I, I can look in the mirror at some signs. I used to have a head full of black hair. and But I came here 13 years ago and all of a sudden it started turning gray. I don't need anybody to tell me about signs. And for those of you who are out there talking about your zodiac sign, let me just help you understand when you become born again, you come out from under those signs. So stop acting crazy and talking about it's your sign because you are a Sagittarius. No, it's a sign that you need to get in the word of God because when you become saved, you no longer let some astrological thing tell you what's going on in your life. You let the word of God tell you what's happening in your life. Look at Mark chapter 6 verse 2. It says, even this man does miracles. They were looking for a miracle. They were looking for a miracle. My brothers and sisters, this is the 47th question in the Bible. And this particular question, Jesus answers himself. I need you to get this part. Wake up and write this down. Question 45 and 46 are in verse 4 and 5. But then notice the next set of questions in question 48 through 56. They're in verses 17 through 21. And in verses 17 to 21, it says, they replied. In verses 17 through 21, it says, they replied. When you look at 45 and 46, Verse 4 and 5, notice this. Question 45 and 46. In verse 4 and 5, his disciples answered him, but where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread for, to feed them? Jesus said, how many loaves do you have? Jesus asked, seven, they replied. So notice the disciples answered the question that Jesus posed to them after they asked the question. But look at question number 47, which is our focal verse here, brothers and sisters. Notice what it says. Why does this generation ask for a miraculous sign? And then Jesus himself answers the question. I tell you the truth. No sign will be given to it. No sign will be given to it. He, he uses the word it. No sign will be given to it. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. What's it? The question. 
that you ask. Jesus says, I'm not going to even entertain this question with an answer. He says, I'm not going to even dignify what you're asking me. This it question you're asking me. He said, I'm not going to even dignify. He calls it an it. He says to them, clearly, I tell you the truth. No sign will be given to it. Translate that for me, Pastor. He says, if you saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, fire baptized, he said, look here, you already know the answer. You already know the sign. He said, I don't have to talk to you about the sign because you already know what the sign is. And for those of who may not know, the sign is the empty cross. And the empty cross is the sign that lets us know what he did on Calvary. I got witnesses here. Brothers and sisters, it's important to notice this. Because in Matthew chapter 12, verse 39 through 40, he says a wicked and adulterous generation asked for a miraculous sign. Then in Matthew chapter 16, verse 3 through 4, he says a wicked, adulterous generation looks for a miraculous sign. Then in Luke chapter 11, 29 through 30, he said, this is a wicked generation. It asks for a sign. So he says that either you're asking or looking and neither one of those will be addressed. He says, so you can ask me all you want to. You can look all you want to because what you ought to be looking at is me because I'm the answer to the question that you're asking. I am the one that's responsible for showing you what the sign is. Which brings us to our final thing. And I think this is amazing to me because what do you do when your rivals show up and the reason by which they come to you is to test you to see if you really are saved, if you really have faith, after they, after they come to you and try to get you, brothers and sisters, to respond to their inquiry, they want you to fall. But Jesus says, I want you to have faith. What does Jesus do? Because I said to you, Mark focuses on the actions of Jesus, not the words of Jesus. So we can get a lesson on how to deal with our rivals by looking at what Jesus does. You got your Bible open? Look at verse 13. He says, then he left them. You thought it was going to be something deep and profound. Then he left them. You see, when your rival comes at you to try to mess you up, Jesus says the best thing to do is leave them. Get away from them. Don't let them mess you up. You see, when God is teaching you spiritual truths, he's teaching you those spiritual truths to give you spiritual insight. And in order for you to have spiritual insight, there's some people you're going to have to get away from around them if you're going to see what God sees. Okay, let me, let me go back. I, I discovered, you see, when, when you're in love, you got to ask somebody outside of the relationship that's looking at the relationship so they can help you understand what's going on in the relationship. Okay, all right, okay, I used to be slow too. Okay, so you're in a relationship and your, your spouse is beating on you. And then you go tell your friends, but then you turn around and go back to the spouse. And you're trying to figure out why your spouse, why your, why your friends are looking at you crazy. Because you come to them asking them for assistance, they assist you, then you go right back into that terrible relationship. You know why? It's because, see, you can't see what they see. You've been blinded by the enemy, and the enemy has kept you from seeing what God is trying to show you. And so I came to help somebody and set somebody free. You should never be in anything, any kind of a relationship that's going to hinder how you view God. If they don't want to come to church, you need to be in a new relationship. If they don't want to have a relationship with God, then you need to get in a new relationship yourself. Never allow anybody to mess you up to the point that you can't have spiritual insight into what God is doing in your life. Physically. Naturally. Because whatever God is doing in your life in the natural, you ought to be able to see it in the spiritual because they ought to coordinate one with the other. But then, now watch this. 
It says, and he got back into the boat. He got back into the boat. Sister Danielle, this messed me up. It said he got back into the boat. 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 So I said, okay, wait, wait a minute. He got back into the boat. Well, when did he get out the boat? That, that's the obvious question. When did he get out the boat? Look, look at verse number 10. <laughs> look at verse 10. He got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalmanutha. He got into the boat with the disciples and went into the region of Dalmanutha. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus, to test him. And they asked him for a sign from heaven. Okay. So, between verse 10 and verse 13, he got out of the boat. Which suggests to me that they got into the boat, went over to the region of Dalmanutha, and guess who was in the region of Dalmanutha? The Pharisees. And so as a result of encountering the Pharisees, he gets out of the boat. Let me say it another way. Be careful when you're on your way to do what God has told you to do. And you come across your rivals on your way. And you allow them to stop you from doing what you're doing so that you can address their petty issues and petty questions and stop you from doing what God is calling you to do. And I've discovered, brothers and sisters, when God has shown you what he wants you to do, somebody always shows up like a Pharisee, Sadducee, or Herodian to try to get you to stop doing what God has told you to do. Most people who quit doing stuff in church is because somebody else in church told them, if I were you, I wouldn't do that. Most solo singers quit singing because somebody in church said, well now, if, if I were you, I wouldn't always sing the solo every time they ask me. I'd have them pay me. I'm just trying to help somebody. When God has shown you something spiritual, there are always rivals that want to contradict what God has shown you in an effort to keep you from doing what God has shown you that he's going to do. And the best thing you can do when God has shown you what he wants you to do, my brothers and sisters, is to get away from round people who are going to tell you opposite of what God has told you to do. And then watch this last thing in this passage. He crossed over to the other side. I want to say this to you, brothers and sisters. Be careful that you don't let people on this side who are so heavenly minded, they are no earthly good. Be careful you don't let people on this side mess you up to the point that they get between you and your destination. Where they get between you and your destiny. You see, things can change so rapidly. The Bible says he crossed to the other side. You see, God wants those of us who are going to the other side to speak up and speak out. He doesn't want us to be afraid to speak power, to speak truth to power. But the Christian has become so shy, so quiet. I like to say we become secret agents. The only way you can determine if we save, you see us shouting on Sunday, but on Monday there's no real evidence of our salvation. God wants us to put him back as the foundation of our families and our institutions. Isn't it amazing you see family members doing more stuff together now than you did before the pandemic? Because we took him out of our families. We took him out of our institutions. And God is saying, I want you to speak up now or forever hold your peace. You do, you've heard that before, haven't you? When people get married, they say, if there's anybody who have a problem with this couple that's getting married, speak now or forever hold your peace. And then everybody's always looking around. Because see, once the wedding has taken place, you cannot speak up. All I'm saying, once you and Christ have been joined together, you should not allow anybody else to speak up or speak out about the relationship that you have with God. Because you know the kind of relationship you have. God wants us 
to say it ain't happening. You're not going to put my life at risk because you don't want to serve God. You're not going to make me question my faith. You're not going to make me doubt who I am and whose I am. I'm going to leave this fool alone. You got to get to a point because you know what a fool is, right? The fool has said in his heart there is no God. So anytime somebody starts talking about there is no God, that's a fool. God says, look, just walk away from them. I'm not going to be part of this foolishness. And so I want to suggest to all of us Jesus said, in essence, it ain't happening. You're not going to mess me up. Yes, we're in a pandemic, but you're not going to mess me up. Yes, we're in isolation, but you're not going to mess me up. Yes, we're in quarantine, but you're not going to mess me up. You know why? Because I know whose I am. But I also know who I am. And I heard the songwriter when he said it, I believe the songwriter said it best. In times like these, you need a savior. In times like these, you need an anchor. And he said, be very sure, be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. In times like these, you need the Bible. In times like these, you should not be idle. Be very sure. And he doesn't say it one time, he says it twice. Be very sure that your anchor holds and grips the solid rock but then I love this last verse in times like these I have a savior in times like these I have an anchor I'm very sure I'm very sure my anchor holds and grips the solid rock so I don't have any issues I don't have any problems I know who's in control of this situation and so I just stopped by to tell you if anybody try to mess with you tell them the pastor say it ain't happening I don't care how long we stay out of church, it ain't happening. I still love the Lord because he heard my cry and pitied by every groan. I'm going to stay with him. I'm stuck with him because you know why? Because I saw a sign. I said I saw a sign. One Friday evening when he put his head in the locks of his shoulder, I saw a sign. And he dropped his head in the locks of his shoulders and he died, stayed dead all Friday. I saw a sign. Stay dead all Saturday. I saw a sign. Stay dead all Saturday night. I saw a sign early Sunday morning. He got up from the grave. I, I saw the sign that I need. And I know that because of that sign, the empty cross, the empty grave, I already know where I'm headed. I'm crossing to the other side. And I'm not going to let you and the evil one stopped me from paying attention to what God is doing in this season. Keep your eyes open. Keep your spiritual eyes open. And keep them on God. Because I promise you, you're going to see God do a great work in the midst of all that's going on. Keep your eyes open. As they used to say back in the day before the television went off, it would say, stay tuned. Stay tuned. God is not done yet. You're going to see some great work from God. But you got to keep your spiritual eyes open. God bless you today. If you're here today, you're not saved. You're not active in anybody's church. And you're looking for a church home. Listen, you need a church home. You need a church home. You can call any church in your area. You can call the Mount Zion First Baptist Church, 225-383-5401. But if you are outside the ark of safety, if you're not saved, if you don't have God in your life in the midst of this pandemic, I promise you there are churches that will receive you. All you have to do is reach out. You're going to have to ask for him to come in. He's not going to bombard his way in. He's not going to force his way in. You're going to have to ask, God, I want you to come into my life. And so if you're here today and you want him to come into your life, just ask him. So we come, we pray for you today that you come, make a decision, we need pick up the Savior. Make that choice. Make that choice. In times like these, we need, we need an anchor. Oh
sure your anchor it holds and grips the solid the solid rock this rock is Jesus This rock, this rock is Jesus, the only, only one. Ooh, be sure, be very, 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 very sure. The solid, the solid rock. Amen. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Again, we want to encourage you uh, to join in again with us on Wednesday at 6.15 a.m. for our morning prayer at 12.15 just after noon for our noonday prayer and 6.15 p.m. for our evening prayer every Wednesday. We also encourage you to tune in with us for our Tuesday evening prayer. Amen. We're going to encourage you also to tune in for our Tuesday evening prayer and then meet us right back here again at 9.30 a.m. on Sunday morning. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ rest truly abide be with us all. Henceforth now and forevermore let us all say amen. Amen. God bless you and have a great day.